Hope is here. Amen, church? Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Orange United Methodist Church. My name is Megan. I am so excited to be here this morning. And I think in a few minutes you're going to be glad you're here, too. Because today we have a very, very special guest. We have Griffin Ross, who's going to play saxophone for us today. And i got to tell you, Griffin's been sitting in the second row for, like, I don't even know how many years. And it just makes me wonder, like, how many, how many others of you out there are musical geniuses and are hiding it from us? So, we, like, really could use some musicians. And if I find out you can play an instrument, I'm so telling Gary. <laughs> so, uh, there is a reward if you turn someone in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you know the person sitting next to you is a musical genius, and they play an instrument, you can tell me today, and we'll get you something for that. It might be like an original Methodist plate, but... Uh, <laughs> about it. So uh, let's go ahead and stand on up and let's sing this morning. Sing to the kid.
together this morning. Father God, we thank you so much for the privilege of being in your house, being able to lift up our voices to you in praise, and just tell you how awesome you are, because you are great, because you sent your son, because you set us free, and we are just so privileged to be here this morning. Please let everything that we do and everything that is said here be glorifying to you this morning, God. And let people this morning who need to be encouraged, be encouraged. We ask all this in the name of your glorious Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I saw some of y'all yawning during that song. I don't know how that is even possible. You must have been up until like 3 a.m. But okay, so I want you right now to say hello to somebody you don't know. If you saw them yawning, please shake them. Thank you. <laughs>
At this time, we're going to welcome Brother Rick to do the announcements. Morning, Rick. Our first scripture this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Beloved, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's now time for the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's offering. If, as the basket passes you, you'll stand and worship with us.
Now they have a rather stringent and a unique approach to membership. Applicants have to submit their application to existing membership of the opposite sex. And they are judged for a 48 hour period and votes are cast based on whether or not they are deemed to be beautiful. At the end of the 48 hour period, if you get enough votes, then you are invited to become part of the community of beautiful people. Now Stephanie writing their article asked about the reason for such an interesting application process and the spokesperson for the website said that this process was necessary, it was a good process because it helped them to keep out, in his words, the riffraff. I thought riffraff was a, a, a foe in an underdog cartoon, right? Okay, there's three or four folks my age in here. <laughs> Stephanie pressed him a little bit further on this and he said, is it elitist? Yes! Because our members want it that way. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we live in a world that does a pretty good job trying to separate the beautiful people from the riffraff, be it through money <coughs> or looks or power or popularity. Is that elitist? Absolutely! Because that's the way folks want it to be. This attitude is even seeped into the spiritual realm in a lot of places. Such is the case in our text for today. We find a woman who would have been classified as part of the riffraff. But her story is completely different than this illustration we just shared because in her case, while her faults and sins are clearly pointed out by Jesus, she's offered an opportunity to become part of the beautiful people, to be transformed, if you will. Not subject to a vote, but through the gift of grace. She's invited to be truly beautiful. Provided that she accepts the offer Jesus gives to her. Provided she understands what Jesus is trying to tell her and what he's trying to tell us this morning. He's trying to tell us that looks are deceiving. And that true beauty, total beauty, is more than skin deep. Now to understand all of this, we need to get a little bit of the backstory, if you will. So get this. Jesus had his disciples have been traveling through the region of Samaria. They come to the ancient village of Sychar. They come to a little well that supposedly belonged to Jacob. And so it's hot and it's dusty and Jesus is tired. He sits down and the disciples go to the village to hunt down some food. Funny thing, they're working McDonald's all along the road, believe it or not. And as they go to town, Jesus notices a woman in the heat of the day, coming by herself to dwell. And to her amazement, he starts a conversation with her. And in that instant, we see a scriptural witness of real relational evangelism. We see what can happen when total transformation takes place. We see that real beauty is something that's more than skin deep. Now what are the real takeaways from this text? Glad you asked that question. One thing we've got to understand this morning is this, that there are people in our world, people that you and I know, who are struggling this morning with a poor sense of themselves, a poor self-image, emotionally, physically, and especially spiritually. Now, if you look at this passage that Ted has read to you, I know some of you are thinking, what's the big deal? He talks to a woman. Big deal. You've got to understand what a radical thing is going on in this passage. Before the first word is spoken, there are barriers that are set up to separate these two. And she's struggling with those barriers and the insecurity that she's carrying with her. What are the barriers we're talking about? Well, to begin with, she's a woman. Jesus is a man. This is in a day and a time when women were rarely seen and seldom have ever heard. Her very gender 
puts her in an inferior position according to her world and in her own mind. Secondly, she is Samaritan. Jesus is a Jew. The Samaritans came from the inhabitants of the ten northern tribes of Israel, the northern kingdom that fell in the 8th century B.C. to the Assyrians. When it fell, the remnants of that kingdom intermarried with the Assyrians, and so their blood got mixed, if you will. The Judeans, by comparison, when they were conquered in 586 by the Babylonians, went off together and came back together, and they maintained their community. They saw themselves as more pure, if you will, than these Samaritans. And they had a great disgust for these Samaritans. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus is telling this, this guy that comes to him? And the priest and the Levite don't do the right thing, but the Samaritan does it. And when Jesus asks him, now who did the right thing? The guy can't even say Samaritan. That's how much they hate him. <coughs> Topping it all off, this is a woman of questionable character. As the conversation goes on, Jesus reveals something to her that she and her whole village already knew. She had had five failed marital relationships, and the current relationship that she was in was not of a marital nature. And this must have been really painful for her. You know how we know? Look at the text. In her day, women went to the well early in the morning. It was cool. And they would go together in groups and they would share the news of the day and they would get their water and go home. It was a time of community and a time of going to work. And yet we find this woman coming by herself in the heat of the day. Why is she doing that? She's doing it to avoid the sneers and the sidelong glances and the snide comments from the, from the other women. By all the standards of the day, she's in the wrong place at the wrong time. She's the wrong gender, the wrong race, the wrong character. With all of that weighing down on her, is it any wonder that she had a poor image of herself both inside and out? She's not alone. There are a lot of people in our world this morning who are struggling with those images. And it blocks them from the throne of grace. Don Miller in his book, Blue Light Jazz, talks about a friend of his named Penny. Penny came to Christ, but at first she really struggled with it. And one of the greatest sticking points she had that Don wrote about was this. He wrote, Penny believed that if all Christians were somehow merged into one human being, that human being probably wouldn't like her. Whether it's a misperception or whether it's fact, brothers and sisters, there's a perception in the world around us that folks are being judged on the basis of labels of race, of gender, and of life situation. And sometimes it comes even from God's own people. These folks want to be whole. They want to be made new. And yet they can't reach out because they are those people to somebody else. They're struggling to know the wholeness that only Jesus can give to them. And that struggle can create in somebody a sense of worthlessness to other people and perhaps even to God. Jonathan Kozel, in his book, Amazing Grace, writes about doing some work in the South Bronx, a place full of violence and disease and poverty, all the ills of society. One evening he was standing with a woman and she, they were listening to her child pray his evening prayers. And this is the prayer the little boy prayed. He prayed, God bless Mama. God bless Nanny. God, please don't punish me because I'm black. Isn't that a heartbreaking prayer? And yet, if we read this text, can't you almost hear that Samaritan woman praying a similar prayer? Lord, please don't punish me because I am a shady Samaritan woman. There are a lot of folks struggling with those burdens today. But here's some good news. The good news is that Jesus came to give those persons in those situations a complete makeover. From head to toe, inside and out. Despite her inadequacies, despite what she was feeling and what society was placing on her, this man, this Jewish man, this Jesus speaks to her. 
He sets aside the conventions of the beautiful people of his day. He refuses to drink the haterade. And he begins to talk. Hey, there you go. Get reference number one. He begins to talk to her. Notice, he doesn't avoid her. He doesn't take glee in pointing out her shortcomings. You know what you're going to do if you don't straighten out? What does he do? He simply begins to talk with her. He opens up the opportunity of them being in relationship. And that makes deeper soul-searching conversation possible. He sees her through eyes of love and he reaches out to her where she is. And in the midst of that deeper conversation that follows, he does point out those errors of her ways. But he doesn't leave it there. He offers her a way out. He offers her hope. He offers her a chance at transformation. He offers her a drink of living water. Not from the well, but from himself. A living water that will transform her poor, broken image of herself into this image that she was meant to maintain. The image of a beautiful child of the living God. Phyllis Berman in the Forbes magazine wrote an article about Quad Graphics Printing Company and their owner, Harry Quad Graphics. In the article, she said, most of the people that work at Quad Graphics would be seen as losers by the rest of the world. But they're grateful for the opportunity that Quad Graphics gives to them. Their owner says that when most of the people that come to them for a job are the folks who look at their shoes when they ask for a job. And we give them a chance to do something with their lives. Isn't that a powerful image? They're the ones that look at their shoes. Our Lord delights in reaching out to those who look at their shoes in spiritual sense to offer them the wholeness of the need. That's what that woman was doing that day at the well. She was looking at her sandals. And that's why Jesus reached out to her. And that leads us, I think, to one of the most important lessons we draw from this text. And it is, this is good news. This is a beauty tip, if you will. We've got to share with some other people. We've got to share this with people. After she encounters Jesus, after he talks to her, he breaks through the barriers. After they begin to establish this relationship, after she surrenders her life to him, what does she do? She turns around and runs back into that town that's hated her and hated on her the whole time. And she shares with them an evangelism crusade, if you will. I mean, you hear what the gist of her message was? Y'all got to come out here and see this guy. He told me everything I ever did. Follow her out and hear that? It'd be interesting, wouldn't it? I'm sure there were some folks in town that they said, Lord, every one of us knows what you've done. But there was something different about her because the town got up and followed her back out to the well, and there they met Jesus for themselves. And isn't it interesting that this woman went back to the town, the folks would not have given her the time of day. The only reason they would look at her would be to scorn her and deride her, and yet she went right back into their midst and shared with them what she knew and led them back to Jesus. That is the nature of relational evangelism. Do you want to lead people to Jesus? You start being their friend. Open that door and allow God's love to flow through you into the lives of other people because it does make a difference. In uh, a book entitled The Tangible Kingdom, Hugh Halter, tells a story about an incident that took place in his life after which he forever changed how he dealt with unbelievers. It was a couple of weeks after 9-11. He was in Queens, New York, teaching church planners. During the evening, he would go down to this little Irish restaurant in the community and he would meet friends, they would have a time of food fellowship, and they would have intense conversations. Their waitress was a, a young lady from Ireland named Fiona. Fiona was a great waitress, and she was genuinely interested in what they were talking about, so she would listen. As the nights progressed, she'd come and listen some more. One evening, though, her doubt really began to creep in, and she said to Hugh, she said, why in the world would you spend all your time making pastors better church leaders when churches really don't make that much difference? Hugh knew something about her background. He knew that she was from Ireland. She 
had been part of sectarian violence in Ireland, uh, Catholic versus Protestant. She'd seen the church fail. She'd seen God's people not even love each other. And it really broke her heart. She couldn't see the wisdom in any of this. And so Hugh changed his tack. He said, Phil, I want you to understand something. Jesus came to bring a new way of living that's free of the exclusiveness and the sin that people live in their lives. And he called that way the kingdom. And it was the greatest thing in the world for the people of his day, and it still is to anybody who wants to know the true God. And Fiona was taken aback, and she said, tell me more about this. I've never heard of the kingdom before. And so he shared with her. On his last night in New York, before he flew back to Oregon, he went back to the restaurant to say goodbye to everyone. As soon as he walked in the door, this voice was heard above the din of the crowd. It was Fiona. Hey, there's that guy I was telling you about. You ought to hear him talk about God. The crowd parted and Fiona led a number of her friends over to Hugh's table. And she said, go ahead, tell them. Tell them, tell them what you told me about the kingdom. I read that story this week. And as I read that, I couldn't help but think, that's the woman in our text. She led those people right back to that well and said, go ahead, Jesus, tell them. Tell them what you told me. She didn't have to do that, but it welled up so much inside of her she couldn't contain it. And because of her, countless people came to know the good news of Jesus for themselves. That's real evangelism. Ted de Haas says that one of the most beautiful wildflowers in Alaska is called the fireweed. Fireweed, besides being aesthetically pleasing, also has some other uses. It's purple, pink blossoms can be boiled in a tea that's good to be taken internally as medicine. It can be rubbed on topically to help with cuts and, and with rashes and with uh, things of that nature. And it can be made into jelly and honey. Fireweed is called fireweed because it's the first plant that springs up in a field after there's been a forest fire. When the smoke clears and the earth cools, these little shoots come popping up out of the ground in that blackened earth. And all of a sudden you have this beautiful quilt of pink and purple fireweed that trades ashes for beauty. And that's the story of the woman in our text for this day, and it's our story. Yes, we may be laboring under some burdens this day, but the good news is that Jesus came to set us free, to be in relationship with us. And he calls us to be in relationship with his lost and lonely children in the world, to show them the way, to bring them back to the well so he can free them. This morning, you've received a formal invitation. You'll receive it through the table. You've received it through his word to become part of Jesus' crew. You've received an invitation to become part of his beautiful people. How about it? Will you accept that invitation? But be advised, this is not a popularity contest. You don't get voted in. This is a gift of grace. And you've got to remember that real beauty is always more. Thanks be to God for his work to us this day. Okay. 
So we're going to close out today, but I'm going to lift your name on high. And it says, tell everybody if I could, because I know, Lord, you've been so good. And ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? So stand on up. Let's sing it out.